Welcome to Lucid Horizon. In this series of programs, we talk about education and democracy and uh, how democracy can uh, elevate the quality of education. In turn, it, education, how education can actually promote democracy in countries that doesn't exist and stabilize democracy in the countries that do exist. Uh, in this series of shows, uh, we've been uh, fortunate enough to benefit from the insights provided by Professor Ushanga Amir Ahmadi, the distinguished Professor of International Relations from Rutgers University. Uh, today, we are going to talk about a very important event which was just concluded in Austria, Vienna. There's the so-called uh, contract and agreement between Iran and uh, the four European countries and the United States and China and Russia, the so-called Joint Com uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action or JCPOA. Uh, welcome to the show, Professor Amir Ahmadi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kangalu. I appreciate this invitation. Looking forward to our dialogue. As you know, um, uh, JCPOA uh, has been in negotiation for almost 10 years. Uh, it reached an agreement in 2015 under Obama administration. Uh, as a result of the agreement between Islamic Republic, uh, the so-called P5 plus one, uh, consisting of uh, uh, Russia, China, Germany, France, England, and the United States. Uh, the agreement was basically based on containment of uh, Iran's nuclear activity, specifically nuclear enrichment. Um, and as a result, uh, the, the members of the JCPOA, P5 plus one, they agreed to lift uh, a series of sanctions, economic sanctions against the Islamic Republic. Uh, this was implemented in 2015 and in 2016 after President Trump came to office uh, within a year and a half, within 18 months after he's assuming the office and assuming power. He withdrew from uh, JCPOA to fulfill his campaign promises of uh, blocking the US participation in JCPOA. And as a result, in the last two and a half years and three years, uh, the uh, sanctions that uh, President Trump has imposed against the Islamic Republic has been crippling, has basically brought, brought the Iran's economy, at least the sales of oil and uh, natural gas to its customers to a grinding halt. And it has posed a great economic hardship on the, on the Islamic Republic. So after Biden came to office uh, and negotiation, he promised as a part of his campaign promise, he promised to uh, renegotiate the JCPOA and get the United States back into the pact. Uh, so the negotiation started uh, last week, last Monday, and just concluded in Vienna. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what happened in Vienna this last year and whether, as it seems, the negotiation has come to a, to a grinding halt and basically it has failed to, uh, to, to bring the United States into the pack and, and resume the uh, JCPOA and get the sanctions lifted against the United States? What, what do you know about what happened in Vienna? In, in, during last week? Uh, thank you, very, very good question. First, uh, uh, let me say that uh, I'm sure you know that I have spent almost 37 years on, in US-Iran relations arguing that the only way forward for Iran and the US is to normalize this relationship. I have always been against sanctions against any partial negotiations between the two countries and I but I very loudly opposed the negotiations that led to JCPOA from the day one. I was against it. I continue to be against it because I believe these partial negotiations will only complicate relations between the two countries and it will not solve any problem. It's a matter of just, uh, you know, the, uh, convenience, for both sides that, that okay, I, you, you, uh, you give me this and I give you that, and then we will come back again to the square one. And then I give you this and you give me that. It's a very bad way of, of negotiating, of solving a problem that is one of the most uh, complicated, problematic issue of this uh, last 50 years, at least after the World War II in, in the world. U.S.-Iran relations is a very, 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 very big issue. I think probably the biggest issue of the post-war 
uh, you know, international issue. Now, <clears throat> first, uh, just to answer your question, uh, at, at, in Vienna, of course, the Islamic Republic had gone there just for a deal, basically saying, I am here and to get sanctions relieved. And then, of course, US said, okay, you wanted to get sanctions relieved for what? He says, for nothing, you know, you left the JCPOA, returned to JCPOA, left the sanctions, okay? And then I decide what to do. That's the bottom line. This radical uh, regime in Iran is, uh, uh, is, is uh, after the experience with the JCPOA, is very uh, distrustful of not the US, but all of the other uh, five. And they don't just trust them. So therefore, their formula is that you will first lift sanctions, then we will, then you will put, we will see, we will test the market and see if sanctions really have been lifted. And then at the same time, you, America, need to guarantee that, that you will not leave any new agreement if it was to be, you know, implemented, had to be concluded, then we will get back to the JCPOA as it was negotiated. So they have three conditions, lift sanctions, let, we will test the, uh, this, this lifting, and then you will also guarantee that you will not leave the Islam. No, United States is not ready for any of this. So Tehran came to Vienna with a position of no, non, no negotiation. This is not a position for negotiation. They came to Vienna not to negotiate. Basically, this is what we want. And only then <clears throat> we will consider, you know, other steps. Now, this is, of course, their maximum position. I believe the Islamic Republic also has a minimum position as well, which will emerge in the course of the next few, uh, few months. And uh, I believe in the interim, they will come to a position of, okay, you lift sanctions and we will freeze our enrichment at this very level. That is, we will not go forward we will not go backward either. We will just freeze it at this point. And then, you know, I, 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 instead, you will give us, <clears throat> you know, the sanction relief. This is, I believe, for now, is the minimum position of, of Tehran. But uh, I believe that what, has, what happened in the last meeting was obviously the United States <clears throat> through Mr. Robert Mali, who is the chief negotiator, yes. okay, had a statement. And the statement was given to the European uh, guy to read it at the meeting. And the Iranian side objected to that, to that statement in two, for two reasons. One, they said, we are not negotiating with the United States of America. So why are you reading their statement? We are not negotiating. So the statement that you are reading from the US is a violation of our agreement that in this negotiation, there is only four plus one, not five plus one. And the second, the tone, of the statement was very harsh, obviously, basically threatening, saying that, you know, if you don't agree to return to JCPOA, we, we have a B plan and that we will have to implement the other plan. And then at that point, Iran said, you know, this is a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a negotiation under Doris and, and that this is a, this, you are making it a direct negotiation with the US. Now, so they left for now. 
One thing I have to say here, uh, Professor Kangalo, as someone who lives in this country, is citizen of this country, teaches in the university in this country, I mean, this country, the United States of America, and uh, the United States of America that is supposedly a superpower, the biggest economy, the biggest military, the biggest whatever in the world now, <clears throat> I am absolutely shocked and in fact, uh, what you call humiliated and insulted that the United States of America should do what it did. You are a superpower. You should not be even accepting to negotiate with Iran indirectly. What that means, you are a superpower. You go and sit in another hotel and get the Europeans and Russians and the Chinese to go and negotiate for you? What the hell with that? Who are you? It is humiliating. It Mr. Is humiliating. Biden, this is humiliating. I want to just the whole world know that you are humiliating even a, a, a person who Shanghai Amir Ahmadi that has another passport in his pocket as well. <laughs> My friend, that's not the way a superpower does. And then, words, so what even you're, what more you're humiliating is that Iran will say, "I don't even want to hear your words." So you're so you're you're advocating that the United States has to take an irreconcilable position with respect to the Islamic Republic, and that will bear more fruit and uh, and bring the uh, uh, the Islamic Republic to a more. Um, amicable and malleable position of behaving uh, even in terms of uh, nuclear enrichment and in terms of the other two concerns that the United States has. Basically, these three major areas of sanction, there are three major areas of sanction. One, only one has to do with, one series of sanctions have to do with, uh, with the nuclear enrichment and the nu nuclear activities. One series of sanctions are directly connected to the proxy forces operating the terrorists operating in uh, Iraq and in Yemen and in Lebanon and in uh, Syria. And then there are a series of uh, sanctions uh, directed to, uh, to the human rights activities. Obviously, those two <laughs> sets of related to the proxy forces and the human rights cannot be lifted. And while the Iranian, it, it, it is my understanding that the Iranian delegation has asked um, the Europeans and the Russians and Chinese, the P4 plus one, that all sanctions, including those three classes of sanctions, have to be lifted. In addition to that, they have demanded that they, the agreement this time, if there is an agreement this time, that agreement has to be ratified by the Congress or by somehow in some legal way, prevent the next administration from tearing it up and putting the Islamic Republic in the same impasse that uh, President Trump did. Obviously, you know better than I do that this in the in the political structure of the United States, it's impossible for one administration to mandate the next administration to do something or not to do something. Uh, so this is either either due to the lack of understanding of the delegation of the Islamic Republic of and their unawareness of the political structure in the United States, or if they know how the politics works, how the government works in the United States, they have uh, this excessive demand in order to kind of get into some later stage negotiation and sw swap favors for favors in the future. So I, I, I like your idea, the idea that you know United States should not subject yourself to humility, but now here's where we are. Here's a president, President Biden, who promised vigorously during the, his campaign, during one year of campaign, presidential campaign, that will get the United States back on the JCPOA. Maybe he didn't have any idea what are the legal costs to United States to get back on the JCPOA. Now, because it seems to me, because it seems to me that uh, the Islamic Republic is aware of uh, this corner in which President Biden has really subjected himself into. He has really cornered himself and he has to live with his campaign promises. Now they are putting these excessive demands on the United States so that if president wants to save face by restoring its agreement and bringing the United States back in JCPOA, they are putting all these excessive demands. Uh, 
um, well, first of all, is that true from your understanding that these two demands have been made? One, all sanctions have to be lifted. Two, uh, there should be a provision that the next uh, administration cannot renege on the on the agreement. And and whether whether this is an indication of lack of knowledge on the on the part of the Islamic Republic delegation about the American political structure. Well, uh, first, as I said, the position the Islamic Republic took when it went to the uh, uh, on the table is a non-negotiation position. It is it is a it is a it's a no go position is a no go position they know that for a fact they know that for a fact they are not that is stupid they know that all sanctions cannot go after all americans have two types of sanctions they call the secondary sanctions and the primary sanctions even the first jcpoa did not touch the primary sanctions primary sanctions are sanctions that Americans have imposed on themselves that an American citizen or entity cannot make any deal with the Islamic Republic. Secondary sanctions are sanctions on other countries. That is China or Europe or South Korea, for example, cannot you know, deal with Iran. And if they do, they will be punished by America. So, even the first JCPOA did not touch any aspects of the primary sanctions. The whole issue was on the secondary sanctions, sanctions on other countries. Even then, it was only nuclear related sanctions, period. Only sanctions that were imposed on Iran for the nuclear reason not anything else. So the Islamic Republic goes there and say, you have to remove all sanctions, <laughs> meaning primary sanctions, secondary sanctions, sanctions that relate to nuclear, to non-nuclear anything. That's a no-go. Nobody in this country has that authority. After all, a lot of the second primary sanctions are laws they have been passed by the Congress. They are not executive orders. Mr. Biden can only lift sanctions that are executive orders. A lot of sanctions on Iran are beyond the executive. They have been put into legislative framework. They are laws. So that is a no-go position. Second, on we will then you know, test if you have left the sanctions means another two, three years. Because even if you lift the sanctions today, any sanctions to get actually implemented and you test the implementation will at least take a year. It is not like, you know, you, implement, you, you release this and I take it. That's not how sanctions work. It's a whole complex of network internationally. And the third, so that is also no go. And third, nobody in this country can guarantee that a United States of America, anybody can leave any agreement, even if the agreement was to be passed by the Congress, still nobody can guarantee that that agreement will stay. Why? Because this is a sovereign nation. No sovereign nation will, you know, tie its hands behind its back. This is a sovereign nation. Any agreement, any treaty, any deal is reversible. Any, absolutely any. There is no deal whatsoever that the United States of America cannot reverse. It's a sovereign country. I don't want this anymore. That's it. So that is also a no-go. It's not just that they don't understand the system. I mean, again, I have learned over and over that they don't understand the US system. But this is not even and this is not even understanding the US system. This is understanding the basic 
the basic international law of sovereignty <laughs> that nations are sovereign entities that they will never ever tie their hands behind their back so that is a no-go position for now um, but the problem is with mr biden i have to say unfortunately let me tell you what the problem is mr biden in the election time said that i have wanted to go back to jcpoa he became president why didn't he go back my question is why didn't you go back who prevented you from going back nobody nobody because jcpoa was not a treaty it was not something that was passed by the congress nobody in the congress could have stopped him from going back nobody absolutely zero person he had the full absolute full authority to return to jcpoa and in fact mr biden reversed many of the policies of mr trump well in this case going back to jcpoa because when the united states came out of jcpoa the u.s obligation was to cancel all the sanctions remove all the sanctions and and islamic republics obligation was to stop enrichment or yes. limit at least enrichment so if united states so by 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 advocating that united states or president biden should have gone back to jcpoa you mean they should the president should have issued an executive order removing all the sanctions that no. president trump imposed no not all the sanctions that Pre president trump signed, imposed lots of non the sanctions that were not in place non-nuclear related yeah. sanctions yeah yeah see i mean all the, they basically what the us could have said mr biden i am going back to the square one that is to 2015 when you know the according to that jcpoa the us lifted all secondary sanctions related to nuclear up to that point nothing beyond that there are other sanctions that even democrats or republicans put after the jcpoa were negotiated those sanctions are not part of the sanction that were removed during you know with the jcpoa agreement so the united states could all simply say all sanctions that relates secondary sanctions this is the key word secondary is key word Every the sanction imposed about, the sanctions imposable on the countries that do trade with the islamic republic that is right that is the meaning of the secondary sanction that extraterritorial we call them extraterritorial sanctions that the united states will remove all extraterritorial or secondary sanctions that were imposed on the islamic republic up to that point that were lifted with the agreement at you know june or july 2015 done and that means us is back in the jcpoa and iran would also have to go back to that square square one which meant it would have it would have to reduce its you know enriched uranium if anything at to the 300 kilogram level at 3.67 enrichment level okay and if it has put any centrifuge ir one two three anything after the us left they should have to remove that as well going back to a square one on both sides but the problem is that the that that mr biden started you know nagging on that up you know promise is it started rethinking and okay it basically procrastinated procrastinated and this procrastination left iran with no option but to leave the jcpo and restart the enrichment now it has enrichment way above any level that in the past it had before the 2015 and could actually build a nuclear bomb the question really is mr biden 
Mr. Biden made a huge mistake. It is the Mr. Biden's responsibility to accept that. But unfortunately, Mr. Biden made another mistake. First, it pro procrastinated. First, it procrastinated. Yeah, delay the decision on it after delay the decision. The decision. And it's almost one year after his presidency. Exactly. And... Second, after it accept, and then when it really got Iran back to negotiation, it accepted indirect negotiation with Iran, and that is the humiliation part. That is, why are you doing that? Why you want to negotiate with Iran indirectly? What is this? Who are Europeans? Who are the Russians and Chinese that will negotiate for the US with Iran? That is really humiliating, okay? It is really humiliating. As I said, as a citizen of this country, I am humiliated with that action. I want to Mr. Biden know that, humiliated. I am an Iranian origin person, and yet I'm talking so openly now. I think if I was Mr. Biden, I will pull out from the negotiation completely. I say I'm not going to negotiate. So in your, in your judgment, uh, is the nuclear agreement JCPOA, the signing of the JCPOA, is it to the best interest, national interest of the United States? It, listen, it doesn't matter. I think I think it didn't matter. You know why? Because the United States national interest is the national interest of Israel. It is the national interest of Saudi Arabia. It is the national interest of Europe. It is a very complicated national interest. Okay, it wasn't like the decision wasn't just for American national interest. But Let we know, just... but we know that what the position of Israelis and Saudi Arabians and the Emiratis are on the nuclear issue, they are absolutely against any agreement. They don't want the United States to have an were... agreement with the Islamic Republic. It didn't matter. It is. It didn't matter. It was the America that made the decision. It wasn't, right. you know, this guys. It wasn't Europe. It wasn't China. It wasn't Moscow. It was the United States of America. The nuclear deal. JCPOA was a deal between the United States of America and Iran That's at right. the executive level. Right. It, not even the legislature right. or anything, just right. executive. But deal. so the United States actually brought the rest of the crowd into the picture just to, uh, to, to indicate to, some kind to of muddy, To muddy the field, the, to That's muddy right. the field. To they had no yes. Some yes. of them played the good guy, the good cop. Some of them played the bad cop. But I've never, but I've never heard anyone actually talking, answering the question I just raised: that whether the signing of this agreement is to the best interest of the United States. And this is the reason why I'm asking this question: is the following. I tell you what it is. I believe it was not. It was not. Yes. I tell you why. Let me tell you, just a few, uh, you know. Okay. First, the United States of America is not threatened by Iran's nuclear enrichment. Just assume for a second, that Iran will go and build five bombs, 10 bombs, right? Israel already have at least 200 of them. A hundred was, is Pakistan has, a three, 400 India has, the United States of America has 12,000 of it. Russia has 10,000, China has 7,000, European altogether have over 12,000. The, the world is full, full of bombs. You know, from the World War One, World War Two, when the first bomb was, you know, exploded on China, since then the number of bombs has increased by probably, I would say, 70, 80,000 times. There were two, three bombs. Now is, there is almost a hundred bombs. Hundred, 100, I'm sorry, a thousand bombs. I'm sorry, hundred thousand. I mean, a hundred thousand bombs. And you know what? The bomb, and this is the key word. America know. Everybody knows that the bomb has become a peacemaker. The bomb is a peacemaker. I believe if the world didn't have these bombs, there would have been the second, third, and the fourth world war already. The bomb kept the World War III behind the scene. 
why countries don't fight? America and China, America and the Soviet Union, because of the bomb. Bomb became a peacemaker. Bomb today is a peacemaker. Israel had this many bomb and had this many war with Arabs, right? Did, could, the, could Israel drop a bomb on an Arab country? No. Did it drop a bomb on Arab countries? No. So what is the usefulness of this bomb? And Iran has a bomb. Okay, so what did Iran have to do? Iran knows that it has five, 10 bombs. And the, the minute he is, you know, starts thinking of using it, the, the whole Islamic Republic, the Iranian country is all down the drain, completely wiped out, completely wiped out. I mean, what is this? This bomb is a joke. This issue of bomb is a joke. So why do you think the United States is demonstrating so much sensitivity towards the Islamic Republic developing the technology of building Because the There is other problems. Because there is other problem. This Islamic Republic this took American hostage. They humiliated them. American hate this, 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 uh, uh, this group of people who run this country, Mr. Obama, Mr. Mr. Biden, Mr. Trump, and they're all generation of the hostage. So why don't, they, why don't they, administration after administration, if that is really the reason, if Americans' feelings and pride were injured by the hostage taking of 1979 by Ayatollah Khomeini, why don't the United States apply a blanket sanctions against the Islamic Republic and never negotiate removing them? Why are they, are they invoking this nuclear enrichment issue and lifting and then restoring and lifting and then the, and all? What is this game? I mean, that's why I'm asking whether. Uh, yeah, the unfortunately, is... yeah, yeah, unfortunately, from the Carter time onward, Democrats and Republicans have increasingly weakened America. You know, I suddenly there is a change of heart, I don't know, or mind, or whatever it is. America is not acting just like what it was. Remember, America was never a warmonger. Really wasn't until recently. You know, they, in, they got into the World War II, you know, by, by the fact of the fact that the Japanese really attacked them. You know, they got frightened. America, when, I mean, I have asked, I mean, it, this is very interesting. America knows that it can use force against the Islamic Republic and bring it to the knees, its knees. They can, of course they can. They have all the means they need, but they, can, they are not ready to use it. They are not ready to use it because they don't have that, that will, the will to use. That will to use force in America is dead. They, the only time they did use it was in, on Saddam Hussein, and that Saddam Hussein really had passed the American red line. The Islamic Republic, after the hostage issue, has never crossed American red line. The Islamic Republic for 40 some years have said, I'm going to destroy Israel. They, uh, we all know that that's a joke and that is a propaganda. That after 43 years, the Islamic Republic has not even sent a missile toward Israel. It's just a joke. And the Israel hit them in Syria, the Islamic Republic would not respond. And in fact, the Islamic Republic took the forces out. The, the God's force, where is the God's force? They are back in Tehran. <laughs> there is no God's force in the region anymore, a few here and there. Okay, so the Islamic Republic and the American administration throughout these 40 years came up with an understanding between them. And that understanding is that the best option for us is no war, no peace. We, do, we don't fight, we don't make peace. And they have been living with it. And Europe, Israel, Arabs, they were all, they have been all forced into accepting it. No war, no peace. All right. And this was imposed on the, on the U.S. by the Islamic Republic, and that was their intelligence. They were really intelligent to design this no war, no peace. Anytime 
the, 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 we move in the direction of war, Mr. Khamenei, okay? You know, uh, issues uh, the, the policy of flexible heroism, right? And any time, any time that we go more toward the peace, it issues the policy of flexible tension. <laughs> the flexible tension versus the, the, the other one. Okay, hero is about that. The point is, the point is they, they have all came to this point that listen, no war, no peace. And I can tell you, whatever it takes, the Islamic Republic will do to maintain this status quo of no war, no peace. My argument for years in the US Iran relations with Americans have been, you are dumb. You are a bunch of dumb people to accept this no war, no peace. You, the way you do, you take the no war, no peace option off the table. And then you say to Iran, the only option on the table is war or peace. War or peace. But it's stupid Americans, you know, policymakers, they say all options are on the table. That is no policy. This is the most stupid lunatic policy that a power could put on the table for a second, third rate power. That all options on the table. Now in Tehran, you know what they, for them, what all options means? All options mean no war, no peace. <laughs> because in the all tape, all options, there are war, there are peace, there are no war, no peace. And you, and think, that the, and you think that no war, no peace is uh, against the interest of the United States? No, it's against the, their interest. That's but right. they have been forced into accepting it. I have been telling America, it is Why not, is in, the that administration it's not in the interest of Iran either. It is not in the interest of Iran either. But it is in the interest of Mr. Khamenei. That he, exactly. It is in, in the interest of their nizam, their, yes. their regime. Yes. It is not in the interest of the U.S. in any way. Right. Okay? Right. United States. So interest. why does U.S. pursue this, this failed policy that is against its national interest? Why is that administration after administration is pursuing it? The only one in the last 43 years post-revolution in Iran, the only president who actually withdrew from that conventional wisdom uh, uh, was President Trump. Why Biden went back to that if it's so clear as you're saying it should be that the United States should not negotiate no peace, no war, and it should say either full diplomatic relations or war. That's what you're basically advocating. Yeah, that's my, I've been advocating this for a long time, either war or peace. And then I have a plan. I said, you Americans say, the war and peace is out. There is war or peace. Either war or peace. Now we Americans want to offer you a peace plan. For the peace plan, here is our what we have, what we are we are ready to pay, the cost for that peace. And if you are ready to pay for that peace as well, then we are done. The normalized relation, all of these issues go. But if you don't then the war will come. And I believe, I have said over and over in the State Department that Tehran will take the peace. Why? Because it cannot fight America. And at that point, Iranian will get into the streets. Just think about it. The, Mr. Biden goes there and says to the Iranian people, I have the regime, a peace or a war plan. Here is my the peace plan and here are the, the peace will go, all the sanctions will go, our relation will normalize, we are back to a square one before the revolution. Or if they don't accept it, we go to the war plan. What do you think about Iranian people will do? <laughs> Millions will, fall, will, will pour in the streets. Millions will pour in the streets. Who wants war with America? And who doesn't want sanctions relieved, relations improved? But Unfortunately, the dumb foreign policy makers don't understand this. 
they don't understand Iran, and they have lost that will, okay, to be resolute. You know, it's funny. One day, I, re I put this issue in the uh, State Department with a major person. I don't want to talk the name. You know what uh, the person told me? He said, Hushan, what will happen if they take the war option? I looked at him. I said, I'm sorry. I wanted to tell you are a down person, honestly. You really are down to think that the Islamic Republic will take the war option with the US. Man, think about it. You know, it just showed to me that either that person is completely lunatic or he, sh I mean, he has lost the will to use American power. Uh, beyond that, I think that person should have not been in the State Department for a second. Unfortunately, the State Department, the foreign policy establishment has been a completely, uh, you know, uh, either humiliated or I don't know what they are. They, when we talk to them, they are humiliated. These people, they, Tehran easily humiliates them. Easily, I mean, think about it. This is a superpower that is indirectly negotiating with, the, with Tehran. And the way it is, they are, this is the way it is, the four plus one with Iran are in this hotel negotiating Tehran, Mr. Mali, is in that another hotel, okay, and are, is listening and getting these messages back and forth. Isn't that humiliating? It is Isn't humiliating and it's frustrating and it's against the national interest of Iran, against the national interest of the United it is States. Against the national interest of anything there. But what it's national a, interest. But it's a game that's been played for the last 43 years and it seems like you and I are not in the position to change it even though the only thing we are doing what we can do, talking about it and, and sharing our, uh, our version of uh, our analysis uh, with, the, with our audience. But where do we go from here? So Anthony Blinken uh, uh, yesterday after the negotiations were uh, concluded in Vienna, he tweeted that uh, he, re he read the pr proposal that the Europeans have forwarded to the United States and received from the Islamic Republic delegation. And uh, after reading the proposal, the two proposals, I don't know why there were two proposals, but after reading the proposal, he came away with the conclusion that the Islamic Republic is not serious about negotiations. Apparently the demands that the Islamic Republic has put in the <coughs> United States is so excessive that uh, even Anthony Blinken uh, cannot withhold his frustration with them calling it uh, unserious about negotiation. So I, what's gonna happen? Yeah, I mean, my question, my thing is, Mr. Bilkin, why should they be serious with the United States? You, you guys, you guys have already humiliated. You are not negotiating. You are in that other, the, you know, they are they are negotiating in a five-star hotel, the most expensive hotel. You guys are in the four-star hotel next door. <laughs> so, so, that's so, right. Why so should why they, why should they why? take you seriously when, it's, Mr. when the United States says you right. easily? Mr. So, Bilkin, they so easily are, get uh, intimidated. That's right. I mean, you are, I mean, again, I, as I started saying, the Islamic Republic didn't go to Vienna to negotiate. They, put, they didn't go to there negotiate. They want to play they the were game. Very loud. They were very loud about it. The problem is Mr. Bilkin didn't listen to them, did not hear them. Before they go to Vienna, they said, we have these three conditions, that all sanctions go, that there has to be a test of sanctions lifted and that you will guarantee. Mr. Mr. Dil Blinken did not hear them. And then at the end of the day, he is surprised. Why are you surprised? Why didn't you listen to them? Why did you, after they said all that, why did you go? Well, they were hoping that the Islamic Republic was bluffing uh, claiming, I mean, demanding those three areas of uh, even, lifting. Even of if, the, listen, in, in, even if you bluff, you have a position. Bluff, any bluff is a position. Mr. Blinken would have said, if I was, I said, that's a no go. I'm so sorry. We don't negotiate. Well, I think the United States is relying on the effectiveness and the cutting 
uh, capabilities of uh, of the sanctions. The sanctions are really hurting Islamic Republic, and the United States is counting that you know the Islamic Republic is coming to the negotiating table because of the the biting aspect, but the biting nature of these sanctions, and relying on the damages that the sanctions are inflicting on the on the Iranian economy. I guess you can understand that why United States went to these negotiations, hoping that the Islamic Republic has learned that U.S. can do even worse, can make the sanctions even worse than what it has been so far. They can so, do anything with sanctions. Well, they will never get Iran on its knees on sanctions. And more importantly, it will never get a deal that will last with that sanctions. I think the only option for the United States of America is first, we say, I will only negotiate directly and bilaterally. Who are Russians and Chinese and Europeans in this game? You're only actually making me, negotiations awkward and indirect and ineffective. That's right. So I will offer to US, to Iran, direct bilateral negotiation, number one. Number two, I will put on the table for Iran war or peace and will deliver on both. If the United States takes these two steps, it will succeed with Iran. Otherwise, the United States will go around the circle ever, ever. Well, I think that's a good concluding point and remarks about our uh, uh, conversations today. It's obviously a fascinating approach and fascinating insight that you have uh, about uh, how uh, U.S. relationship with uh, with Islamic Republic should be managed going forward. And your, uh, if I want to summarize uh, your position, your position uh, of if you had the ear of the U.S. president, you would have advised him to get out of Vienna, um, completely forget about JCPOA, let JCPOA die, let J let Islamic Republic go ahead with its nuclear enrichment if, it, if they think that would be their strongest negotiating point and uh, offer either direct negotiations, direct conversations about establishment of full diplomatic relationship or going to war. And uh, you think that would be more effective uh, because this other approach has not bear any fruit, has not borne any fruit in the last 43 years. Is that a fair summation of your uh, of your position with respect to JCPOA? Yes, absolutely. I'm, but but also going to war before they go into war. Remember, I said that you would give them a peace plan, a big big carrot. If the carrot is not taken, then you deliver the stick, the biggest stick. Yes. All right. But I believe if the United States was to offer the big plan, the big carrot, Iran will take it because the Islamic Republic is not in a position to reject that given the Iranian people's demand for a better life, okay? And for the sanctions go and they live, you know, get into the better uh, life. So again, yes, I think I, if I was US, I would walk out of the, uh, this Vienna framework, completely get out of this five plus one framework, I will offer Iran first direct bilateral negotiation. And right at that point, will offer Iran two options, war and peace. The war, of course, is war, the peace is that's direct negotiation. And that is uh, that during that negotiation, Iran, US has to be prepared to offer Iran uh, a, a big carrot. So then it has to take it. Otherwise, the war will come. And I believe, again, there will never be a war because the Islamic Republic cannot fight the United States of America, period. Well, thank you very much, Professor Amir Ahmadi, for fascinating insights into this matter. Definitely. Uh, a different approach to uh, negotiation and management of uh, international relations, at least when it comes to U.S.-Iran relationship. Um, we are going to conclude our program here and hope that next week we can continue our conversation with you on a different topic uh, that probably would be resumption of if uh, negotiations get resumed 
uh, in Vienna since uh, all delegations have been sent home and there's been a week of recess uh, announced and probably they will be back in Vienna a week from now. And uh, at that point, we would, be, we would have a better understanding of how they have uh, uh, regrouped and how they have uh, repositioned themselves for another round of negotiation or completely bring it to a halt. So thank you very much. And uh, we will say farewell to our, uh, our audience and we will see them next week. Thank you. Thank you for this good discussion.